let's get started, guys. Uh, my name is uh, Sanjay Paranji, and I'm the CTO for Anadarko Petroleum Corporation. Um, and I have here with me my engineering team who's going to talk about an IoT use case today. Um, so let's start with uh, a little bit of a macro view first and talk about why energy matters. And I want to give you a feel for um, who Anadarko is. Uh, we're an upstream oil and gas producer um, in the energy sector, but we want to talk about who Anadarko is. And we'll talk about some IoT specific use cases and then get into the engineering uh, pipeline diagram and the build out we did uh, for capturing the use cases in GCP. So here's an interesting view of the world. When you think about uh, oiling and natural gas, building blocks for modern life, uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, an interesting status, 96% of all the products they use uh, in a given day um, have some form of petroleum or petroleum derivatives um, in them. So it's a, it's a fairly uh, ubiquitous commodity, so to speak. Uh, when you think about um, uh, the global energy consumption, um, half the energy consumption in the world is oil and gas today. Uh, and this is a fairly important stat. And anywhere there's energy, there's uh, almost immediately following that is human well-being and economic prosperity. So uh, we take, uh, you know, when our company producing energy pretty seriously, and we do that in an environmentally responsible way. Um, last but not the least, is probably the most key statistic here, which is the global oil consumption. So if you look at the world and what we consume in a given day, uh, we've got something like 100 million barrels consuming, uh, you know, c consumption every day which equates to something like 1,000 barrels a second. Uh, it's a fairly significant amount of consumption. And when we look at uh, you know, how this sort of forecast for demand grows over time, uh, by 2040, uh, the forecast is that we'll have grown the energy consumption by about 25%, uh, and that's the, that's the demand um, out there that's been forecasted. And the question for the energy sector, and oil and gas in particular, is how do we keep up? And uh, uh, we feel like Anadarko is a part of that solution. And so we get to uh, who's Anadarko, and I've got a couple of tidbits about the corporate portfolio here uh, that give you a sense for uh, who we are and uh, where we produce uh, oil and gas uh, in the U.S. and internationally. So when you look at uh, uh, West Texas, which is a, uh, a cornerstone uh, of the portfolio for us, uh, we're an emerging giant. We attribute something like four plus billion barrels of resources uh, that we have to extract with the, you know, from underground over the next four or five decades. Uh, we have something like 10 to 20,000 locations we're going to drill over time um, in that play. And uh, all that's enabled by a, a fair amount of technology going in. Uh, when we look at uh, Mozambique, uh, we're talking about the, one of the largest LNG projects. It's not online yet, but it's expected to be online by 2021 or 2022. Uh, we're going to extract something like 75 trillion cubic feet uh, from underground there. And that'll be one of the largest LNG projects in the world, if not the largest. Um, so. We're part of both those um, areas, and we feel like that's how we keep up with the energy demand, and we feel like we're part of the energy solution in that regard. Um, going back to some of the software stuff, we do invest a lot of money back in the communities and areas we operate in. Um, and here I'm showing a stat that tells you that we've invested something like $2.6 billion uh, back in the areas and communities that we, we operate in. Um, and last but not the least, the, the group I lead, eight, which is uh, Advanced Analytics and Emerging Technologies, uh, it's the R&D arm in the organization that's responsible for a lot of the technological um, underpinning of making all this stuff happen. So when we think about Anadarko in action and look at the, some of the digital solutions we're, we're, we're trying to formulate going forward uh, to enable the, the portfolio that you saw before to work, uh, we think of them as three block classifications. Uh, the first one is exploration, which is all about trying to find um, oil and gas accumulations across the globe. And that's a combination of deep domain expertise that we have in finding oil and gas, and also uh, uh, a data mining, uh, a combination of the two skills is what gets you uh, exploration success. Uh, development is the second broad category, and that's about extraction of uh, the found oil and gas, the discovered oil and gas accumulations to surface. Uh, and that's about trying to find the most capital efficient way to do it, because we want to be a profitable company at the end of the day. Uh, and the most capital efficiency is dictated by um, how many wells you drill and complete to extract a certain amount of resource. Um, and you want to do the minimum in capital expenditure and extract the most um, out of the ground. Uh, from an operations perspective, we, we deal a lot with real-time telemetry. Um, Anadarko, for example, collects something like uh, uh, 3.6 to 4 million sensors that we have in the field, uh, from um, all the way from drilling and completion sensors, which is rig operations, 
hydraulic fracturing operations, et cetera, uh, all the way to uh, the gathering and supporting infrastructure we need uh, to separate crude oil from its byproducts and deliver it to market. So when you accumulate all the number of sensors we have in the field, we, we have something like four million sensors in the field that are doing something like a, a billion to billion point five updates a day uh, because we're recording multiple points a day. Um, and uh, we can now think about things like fleet performance concepts. When you go to GE and look at aviation turbines, uh, we can apply some of the same concepts looking across the entire fleet of assets um, in the oil and gas sector in the context of uh, some, of the, some of the operations we have, uh, which includes construction of wells, uh, which we call drilling and completions. So the use case we're going to talk about today is all about uh, something called real-time drilling, which, as the name suggests, is about trying to beam um, IoT devices or putting IoT devices on uh, drilling rigs, which uh, if you think about what a drilling rig does, it bores a hole through the ground. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the oil and gas sector, that's what we do. We just bore a, a hole through the ground, and you want to do it in the most efficient way. And so oftentimes, uh, when you do that, you have to track operational metrics like uh, rate of penetration that you achieve, your drilling bit health, etc. And the more real-time telemetry you work with, the more... Uh, the more sensory inputs you have to be able to assess the health of your operation. That's number one. The second construct is uh, just like you plot a course and a navigation course from going here to Oakland, uh, we have the same exact problem. We are trying to drill a target uh, down uh, several miles below the surface, uh, which is roughly 12 to 13 inches in diameter. So think of this as like a dinner plate. Uh, you're trying to hit a dinner plate several miles under the surface or under the ocean, and, and trying to do this with the surface controls on a rig. And, uh, uh, if you have real-time telemetry, it allows you to plot uh, a course and correct that course uh, between, by measuring rate of deviations, rate of change between uh, the planned well path, you know, the planned path you, you, you proposed, versus what's actually happening um, as, we, as we sort of drill the well. So you try to measure rate of deviation and a course correct on the fly. And in the old days, that used to be an operation that was only possible retroactively. Um, it was not possible in real-time mode but now we can course correct within minutes and seconds when we find out we're off course. So that's the second construct. Um, and you know, what we do here is we, we process a, um, uh, electronic data recording data you know, coming from uh, drilling rigs, and we were able to stream that data in and look at operational KPIs and build predictive models on the back of that data. Um, that's what we do. So the use case we're going to talk about is going to delve in some level of detail and really gets into the use case for what that looks like from a pipeline and engineering perspective in GCP, because it's natively built within GCP. That's, the, that's sort of the beauty of it. So here's a quick demo. So what you see here is the dashboard. This is a business outcome we're striving for. This is in front of the drilling engineers and the asset teams, and they look at this on a daily basis. So what you're seeing is sliding time windows, and you're getting uh, you know, things like uh, rate of penetration metrics, uh, connection time metrics, uh, tripping time metrics, etc. cetera. Uh, tripping is the operation of connecting pipes. Um, so we're able to not only look at various metrics and look at uh, in how we're performing uh, our operation from a health perspective, but we're also able to understand and look across the entire fleet, which is the idea of trying to now position a well or a rig operation against other rigs you know, that, that are operating at the same time and look at the bell curve of the entire fleet at the same time. Uh, and also look at performance against previously known best performance. So you were able to see for within the guide rails or what you achieved before, you were off the rails. Um, what this shows you is multiple wells and multiple rigs being plotted up at the same time. And all this is possible with real-time telemetry. So you're looking at real-time stacks of each well against each other. And you're doing that live and, and, you know, and you're slicing and dicing actively uh, within the application we've got. But fundamentally, it's enabled by uh, a lot of the aggregation that's done at the back end. Um, so again, uh, you can see at the bottom there on the right hand side, the rate of penetration does vary quite a bit um, amongst the different wells. Uh, and that's a fairly important indicator for us to see uh, how we're performing the operation. Um, and I'll give you another snippet, last bit here, which is uh, a 3D diagram that shows you uh, the well path. And so what you're seeing is uh, wells drilled off a single pad. You can see how complex it is and how tightly spaced the wells are. Um, the idea here is that you're able to see the planned well path, um, which is in uh, blue, and the actual well path, which is in red, we were able to see that against the offset wells in the same pad. Um, and what you're doing there is you're, you're trying to basically avoid, uh, you know, uh, collision risk uh, between wells. And when you sort of zoom out and look at the complexity that we're dealing with, uh, we're actually looking at wells from multiple pads now. Um, you're able to see now how that well that you're drilling positions against all the offset well paths 
um, with just simple telemetry being beamed into the historian and then that being displayed into a web application with a lot of predictive modeling being done on the back end. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Eric Garcia, who heads up uh, our cloud engineering department, um, and he works very closely with Google Resources uh, to make all this happen. Thank you. Thanks, Sanjay. So we were working on a cloud-based uh, blueprint uh, to, to empower applications such as real-time drilling you've just seen. Since we started our journey in implementing this blueprint in GCP, we've seen uh, several key benefits, high scalability being one of them. Serverless components such as BigQuery, CMLE, and Dataflow proved highly scalable. This has let our developers focus more on the business logic and less on scheduling and scaling aspects. Another one we've seen is for the operations teams. Um, big, a big benefit on having the operations teams be more smaller and nimble by using platform components such as GKE and Bigtable. Um, you know, avoid a lot of low level platform engineering skills in the team. Uh, thus, they're more nimble to customer needs. Another big benefit was the reliable services. On average, we've seen about four, four nines of uptime per up, uh, GCP component average. Um, Insight Tool is the final one. Um, data Studio, Data Lab, um, Stackdriver has provided benefits to both ops and data scientists alike. All these help further accelerate our time to market for our applications. We decided to start on the cloud first. Um, we used a lot of our existing data infrastructure um, in getting the data back, whether that was stuff that was housed internally or with uh, partners. Um, we wanted to do a quick POC to prove out the data engineering and model workflows um, and iterate through various approaches. This all sets the stage for having digital twins in our applications. This is kind of a grouping I came up with to, to describe the, the components, if you will. Some are open source, some are GCP native. Um, I grouped them as data movement and stream processing, data at rest components making up our central data repository, orchestration and deployment tooling, app code and runtime environments, and then insight tooling for visibility, alerting, and development. Here is a high-level uh, diagram uh, showing our general data flow and ML processing pipeline flows. Um, not everything is depicted here, um, just the higher-level components. Um, but this shows that we have several uh, time series data sources that we're, we're inputting. Um, they make up, they're made up of external data service endpoints, uh, vendors such as Calvin, um, manage, who manage our edge deployments, also uh, input and integrate data into GCP components in our tenant. Um, a large part of our data also comes from our on-prem historians, such as OSI Pi. Um, getting data from OSI Pi, we had to develop custom uh, near real-time data pipes uh, to pull data into GCP. Um, we also have Spark uh, mechanisms to generate uh, Parquet files to, to help the batch data for historical loads. Um, data, data flow is pr proven as a good data transformer and mover to places of rest, such as OpenTSDB and BigQuery. Uh, Cloud Composer drives our, our model training pipelines, uh, which, you know, Composer is made up of Apache Airflow underneath. And then uh, GKE kind of houses our inference models, our main applications, as well as you know, some data engineering components such as OpenTSDB. I'm pleased to introduce Nick from Google PS team, who's been a, a good partner through our, our POC blueprint definition and implementation. Um, Nick has a lot of oil and gas experience, and we'll dive a little deeper into the data components. All right, well, thank you very much, Eric. And uh, yes, as uh, Eric said, uh, my name is Nick Lozier. I'm a Google Cloud professional services consultant and uh, been at Google just over a year. Uh, spent about 10 years in the upstream oil and gas space. Prior to that, I uh, focused on data analytics and actually had the opportunity to productionize a workflow uh, quite similar to what Anadarko is doing here in the cloud. Um, however, it was using on-premise Hadoop technology. 
So this project has been like great to um, you know, talk about scaling this sort of like workflow on Google Cloud, uh, Google Cloud uh, together. So with that, let's uh, dive a little bit deeper into the uh, data repository aspect of this IoT blueprint. There's three different components that we're using. There's uh, Google Cloud Storage, Google Cloud BigQuery, and Google Cloud Bigtable. And for the folks in the room who are familiar with uh, databases, you may wonder, you know, why duplicate uh, this time series uh, IoT data in two different databases, including BigQuery, in addition to uh, uh, Bigtable. And uh, I think the trend that we're looking up at the screen there is showing, um, you know, the recent trends from dbengines.com, uh, change in popularity of, of uh, time series database, really it's, it's like up and to the right, you know, it's hockey sticking to the right. And I think there's a couple of reasons to explain why time series database is um, growing at such popularity. You know, uh, IoT data is, is growing tremendously in size, and uh, the velocity is, is really kind of hard, hard to track. And, you know, businesses like Anadarko, as we saw in, like, the real-time drilling application, want to um, enable real-time applications using that IoT data for, for use cases like trending and monitoring and machine learning. So um, in addition to having that SQL interface to the data uh, that BigQuery provides, you know, the, the APIs that um, a time series database gives you is, is also critical, and that's why it's part of our solution. So how can a time series database be run on top of Google Cloud Platform? There's a couple different options, but what we'll talk about here is a solution that involves OpenTSDB and Cloud Bigtable. So OpenTSDB is a scalable, open source solution that's really been around for a while. I think it's into version 2.4 at the moment. And um, as it says here, it's, you know, it's compatible with Apache HBase, um, Bigtable, and I think it's even compatible with Cassandra too. However, on, on GCP, you're using Bigtable, which is another fully managed solution, and it really makes the, the infrastructure, the maintenance, the setup, the overhead, like, you know, pretty, pretty simple. And you're really just talking about like getting the data volumes in there to enable your, your, your analytics and real-time applications. Um, you know, it also includes a couple things that aren't included in a SQL API, including a, um, a REST API for query and um, input, this ability to downsample data. So, you know, when you have extremely noisy time series points that might be at the millisecond level, and you want to kind of like smooth out the curve into maybe every 10 seconds, like OpenTSDB is really good at downsampling. And it also has this element of tags to, to provide filters on that time series data. You know, I want to give a shout out to the Cloud Bigtable team because on this project, uh, they really helped us out. First of all, they published this solution on the Cloud blog that helped us stand up the whole solution like quite easily. Um, it it's really gives you the instructions. There's a whole, there's several GitHub links up there to the left. And um, another, another uh, Cloud Bigtable member is named Solomon um, actually helped us create the data flow pipeline to, uh, to move the data into Bigtable like very easily and seamlessly. So uh, Solomon and Sammy, I just want to say thanks for all your help. So uh, taking another look at data flow here, the, the, the architecture supports, supports both uh, batch loading in, in addition to uh, streaming ingest of telemetry points. And Eric mentioned in his part that, you know, Anadarko uploaded over 100 billion uh, time series points, historical points from a um, offshore platform, I think it covered maybe like three to five years. They extracted this from on-prem, they put it into Parquet format, and they loaded it to Google Cloud Storage. And from there, the team had a very easy time loading that from GCS into BigQuery with a couple simple commands, and we were able to, like, you know, I think in under an hour, have all 100 billion points pretty much ready to go right inside of, uh, in, of, of BigQuery. After only a few uh, quality control steps, we then uh, moved the data from BQ downstream into uh, Bigtable. We backfill Bigtable. We'll actually see a, a pipeline demonstration in a few moments of how that part worked. Looking a bit further to the left, um, a very similar pattern exists for the streaming inserts. So we have batch, we have streaming. The only real change is we're using PubSub as our source instead. So Cloud Dataflow, which is a runtime for Apache Beam, really makes it very easy for nearly identical, identical code to uh, you know, handle a very similar pipeline. And, you know, other, other architectures really require, like, full rewrites to, like, make this possible. So, you know, Beam was, was pretty strong here. One other thing I want to mention is uh, we, we leveraged the new uh, BigQuery storage API 
to pull that, that large amount of data from BigQuery and move it into Bigtable. Like I said, it was 100 billion points, it's quite a lot of data, and this new storage API basically lets you access the storage layer of BigQuery directly. So previously when you like, you know, extracted data from, from BQ, it would move out to GCS, and that process you know, was a little bit time consuming and expensive, not bad, but this is actually a lot more efficient. So we used the alpha version and it actually just moved to beta, and it, you can see like, you know, Cloud Dataflow is a consumer on this slide, data proc, even third party tools like Looker, Mixpanel, JDBC. So expect to see more consumers from BigQuery using the same approach. All right, so from here, let's take a closer look at our historical backfill data flow process. So up here on the left, we're actually seeing the BigQuery storage IO, and it's actually the alpha version, it's now beta, you know, but it's basically pulling straight from that table that holds the 100 billion records. At this point, I think we'd already handled like 700 million rows in some 20 minutes. The subsequent steps are actually taking that data and preparing it to write directly into Cloud Bigtable. And we're using uh, Java SDK for Dataflow here and using the native OpenTSDB libraries to write directly to Bigtable. As we look down to the right here, we can see that Dataflow is using over 100 workers, or I think it's more like 100 like, CPUs. It might have been like 20 to 30 workers. So it's scaling you know, a single pipeline across all these different machines in order to handle this really large backfill operation like extremely fast. Next, we're gonna take a quick look here at the, the big table monitoring statistics. For this backfill operation, we actually upscaled the cluster. I believe we used 130 big table nodes. So it's actually, you know, it's quite large, but it's only very temporary. You know, we, we, we turn it up for maybe a day or two, we churn through those 100 billion events, get the time series da database loaded, and then when we finish up, it's as simple as turning it down because the compute is detached from the storage. So uh, really pretty convenient. Again, like we're not talking about standing up HBase clusters or you know, VMs for any of this stuff. It's just you know, really a few API like instructions via the UI. So pretty darn convenient. So to recap, um, I, I do think that IoT analytics truly benefit from having an API to the data, like for query, both from SQL, BigQuery, in addition to a time series interface, which OpenTSDB provides. You know, reading data at scale from a structured source, it's very easy and better to do now with the BigQuery storage read API. And finally, like, you know, Apache Beam with Cloud Dataflow enables both historical and streaming pipelines to be performed, like, with near identical code. So scale up on your data flow skills if you haven't. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and pass the, the presentation over to my colleague, uh, Ryan, who, who worked on the ML part. Come in. Thanks. All right, thanks a lot, Nick. Um, hi, I'm Ryan Gillard. I'm a uh, machine learning engineer at Google. And uh, when I'm not helping uh, customers create machine learning models and pipelines, or doing research, I'm also working in the Advanced Solutions Lab where we have uh, customers come on site and we teach them for about four weeks, machine learning, TensorFlow, and how to integrate that all into GCP and take advantage of that power. So for this project, what we did, here's the IoT blueprint for machine learning you can see. Um, we used several different um, services, which was a lot of fun because um, we really got to see how they all interact with each other and take advantage of the uh, scale of GCP. Um, the main heart of it all was BigQuery. That's where most of our stuff came from, and then we would send that off to different jobs. All of the ML pipeline was orchestrated by Cloud Composer, where we uh, set up different pipelines uh, in a directed acyclic graph, or a DAG, which essentially just takes one process, and then that calls the next process when it finishes, calls the next process. And you can have multiple branches and everything. Um, it's really nice to tie all this together into a nice automated pipeline where you don't have to worry, don't have to manage it, it's all taken care of for you. Um, for the actual two pipelines we made, we made one for training and one for serving for inference. Um, for the training, we pulled out of BigQuery, which came from OpenTSDB, and then we would train on that with Cloud ML Engine, and then we would send that off to a, our saved model with our saved weights and parameters for our model, and we would then use that in the serving pipeline, which will read those in as data comes in and be able to create the predictions and send them back to OpenTSDB 
in almost real time so that it can be plotted for visualizations right along with the true data. So it was really great, it was really fast, it was um, pretty cool how it turned out. So here's a little demo. Uh, so walking through the composer, so it's all under the hood is uh, Apache Airflow, but it's all managed by composers, so it takes care of it for you. Um, you can create different environments, uh, check out the web server, uh, look at logs, look at your DAGs, the code you have there. It's all uh, Python files. Um, you get a little dashboard like this, it's really nice. Uh, for this project, we had multiple DAGs. Each DAG did a different thing. We had a master DAG that called it all off. Um, you can set up schedules. Uh, you can look at the owners, uh, the recent tasks that happened, the last run, uh, all the statuses of what happened. You can look, kick off a job right now, do look at the tree view, the graph view, look at how uh, your, your run times have been going, look at the code itself, refresh, um, a lot of cool stuff. Uh, well, currently we have it set up to do um, uh, daily, but you can have KPIs that'll, um, you can have it metrics say, hey, maybe we gotta run a little bit sooner because this distribution changed. So right here, this is the master DAG. This is what kicks it all off. As you can see, it's pretty small. Uh, essentially, we just get some of the training arguments and configurations um, so that we can uh, send those off to the rest of the uh, pipeline. And then right here, we call off our pre-processing um, DAG. Uh, as you can see, this is all just code under the hood. Uh, you create operators, um, airflow operators, and those create tasks, and then you link them together downstream, upstream, et cetera, on what you need. All right, so here's the pre-processing. Let's change the view a little bit because it's a little bit big. All right, uh, I still gotta zoom out a little bit. All right, so this was basically done with all BigQuery. I really love BigQuery, it's so great. It's uh, super fast, super scalable, and uh, we had Python operators that were creating dynamic SQL queries and sending them over. Uh, it was really good, cool stuff. Um, so how we started to get our, get our configurations, like our sequence lengths, our tags for our sensors, get all those in, then take our data, and then we're gonna do a pivot operation on all that. From there, then we're gonna create our, our actual data set. We're gonna split it off into train, validation, and test sets. And from there, what we're gonna have to do is say, hey, um, I need to know how to scale these things because machine learning works better when things are scaled. So I used my training set to figure out those scaling parameters, medians, standard deviations, and stuff. And then now that I have that, I save that in BigQuery and then use that with a simple join to uh, then scale my three data sets. From there, I need to turn them into sequences, because right now it's row, 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 it's, it's, that's your time steps, but I need to get them into one element, okay, so that I can do batching from a machine learning. So we use that, which is string aggregation in, in BigQuery over some windows, it's really nice. And then we just remove all of our files, uh, if we have any, and then write them out to CSV and JSON, and then we call off our training job, because our data is ready to go. So let's have a look at the, our training job. So let's change the view a little bit. All right, so here we go. We have to get our configurations again. Obviously, if I made a certain sequence length when I made the data, I need to use that when I'm actually doing the training. So I need to get those arguments. I then check to see, do I have my data available? If I do, continue on and then train on those sets. And then once I have a trained model, then I'll do batch predictions on my three sets and then write those to disk. Um, it's good to always do that in production ML to have those things so that you can, have something to go look at and validate against uh, anything that ha happens down the road, you have something to fall back on and say, oh, now I can reverse engineer this and maybe figure out what's going on. All right, so this is our deploy. So if you want to deploy to ML Engine, we just had this simple pipeline uh, where we're checking to see, do I have a model? If the model's already there, don't overwrite it, create a new one, a new container for that for our versions. If not, then can do one. Do the same with the versions. It's really nice with these uh, branch Python operators. It's really cool how you can have multiple different paths within the DAG based on conditionals. And then from there, um, we have our batch predictions. Pretty simple, it's delete the old predictions, write new ones. And, um, and that is the training uh, pipeline, all right? so. A little recap, there's mainly just basically six steps. If you condense that all down, all those nodes. Um, first, you gotta read the data, obviously. You need to get it out of OpenTSDB, and then we're gonna send that to our heart, our BigQuery. Um, that's where all that pre-processing is gonna take place, all the pivoting, all the cleaning, all the filtering, um, and then turning it all into sequence data. Then, once you have the data done, obviously you wanna train it. 
Okay, so then training it, taking that CSV files for training, send it off to Cloud ML Engine. It'll read it in batch by batch until we have a really nice trained model to uh, do that uh, predictions. It's uh, essentially it's just an encoder, decoder, autoencoder for anomaly detection, trying to look at anomaly scores. Uh, and that way a person can then go and say, hey, this is looking to be anomalous. Perhaps we should intervene before the entire system collapses. And therefore you have a much reduced uh, downtime. Once you have all that, like I said, you want to do batch predictions then on those three sets we made, so that way we can have some kind of validation against. And then we need to write all that back to GCS and then transfer it back to BigQuery, which then we're gonna visualize from to see graphs and plots and all these other things to be able to check and say, okay, look, things are looking well. Oh, there's maybe an anomaly or something. Uh, we should go back and maybe retrain or something else. So that's the training pipeline. But we all know that the entire reason for machine learning is not to train and spin up computers and go through tons of data for nothing. It's all about prediction. That is the whole point of machine learning is can I make really good predictions fast, okay, and at scale. So with this, we use Kubernetes. Um, for this one, we are, have a bunch of Python code that is hosted in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we mainly did this so that we have an internal IP. Uh, that was secure and everything. We read all of our data in, in batch format from OpenTSB directly. Uh, then we had to do pre-processing. Obviously you wanna do the same pre-processing steps you did here as you did in training. Otherwise you're gonna end up with terrible training serving skew and you're basically predicting from a different distribution than what you trained on. So same pre-processing pipeline. From there, we're gonna do our predictions. So we're gonna load our saved model that we saved out to Google Cloud Storage from the training process load it into our Kubernetes uh, memory, pass in our, our uh, pre-processed data, and out we'll get our predictions. With those predictions now, I need to do some more with it. I need to post-process them and make sure they're separated, unpivoted, everything's ready to go, because I'm gonna write that back. It's gonna go to PubSub, and from there, it's gonna be feedback into OpenTSDB and to BigQuery through Dataflow jobs, and then it'll be plotted on our dashboards in almost real time. It's really fast, it's uh, very, very fast. So that's how the inference pipeline looks. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Eric to uh, cover the rest. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Well, now that we have the time series data at rest and, and the model data also at rest, um, how do we get some insight in, into that? Um, we found that we started using Grafana a lot for dashboarding in a couple ways. Um, for data science inspection of individual tags, um, it's been really handy. Uh, another way is also for data outage alerts um, for more on the ops team side. Um, also, we have the same near same capability with uh, Data Studio for getting into that same model result data into um, inside of BigQuery. Um, as Ryan alluded to, um, Data Lab and the Deep Learning VMs um, they provide a low ops uh, Jupyter Lab like environment uh, for data science development, all respecting the GCP IAM security side. And then finally, Stackdriver has also been valuable in helping us uh, monitor message queues to see when there's also data, data outages in those too. Um, most of our, our compute environments uh, consist of GKE. Um, we have uh, basically per app namespace is created, sometimes per project. Uh, we have everything locked down via GCP IAM service accounts for deployment, as well as RBAC security applied. Um, our namespace quotas are also applied and pretty locked down, so we avoid any noisy neighbor issues. Um, for some of our high I.O. or high CPU workloads, we'll also cordon off on a special nose, node pools, sometimes GPU node pools, scaling back to zero when needed. Uh, the traffic is directed through Nginx ingress controllers. Uh, they're fronted by GCP internal load balancers uh, with wildcard DNS applied. Um, the diagram you see here depicts pretty much what you saw uh, Sanjay demo around the RTD application. Uh, it consists of a uh, Angular single page application uh, backed by a Spring Boot Java application for the back end. Um, liveness and readiness probes are, are mandatory in our clusters so we can monitor the health and, uh, and Kubernetes can restart anything that's deemed unhealthy. Um, also the inference models as Ryan mentioned are also running in the same multi-tenant cluster 
Um, they're also taking advantage of horizontal pod auto scaling. And then for our CI CD tooling, we uh, continuous, uh, continuously deliver the, uh, all the components from the inference side to the RTD app. Also, the runners are in GCE. Uh, in conclusion, and in, in some future directions we have, uh, we'd like to further our cloud automation um, with Git-based tooling such as Terraform and Spinnaker, which we've been looking at. Um, more cloud service adoption. Uh, a lot of them have been announced this week. So anything from AI Hub to Cloud Run to Traffic Director for, for more of a managed Istio approach. Um, and eventually this is all getting us towards the edge. Um, we're looking at several uh, IoT edge platforms so we can you know, automate these retrain models, um, custom apps, and, and configurations. Uh, we're hiring, and uh, any questions? <laughs>